<laughs> yeah, and the um, yeah, Chaihu actually is the uh, first major space in Shenzhen, and we start from uh, 2012, and we start to uh, host major fair Shenzhen since 2012 as well, and then we are um, we host a, 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 a lot of meetup events and, and mixers in the past six years, and also. Um, X Factory uh, is, is our brand new project that we just launched a new space in March uh, this year. And the mission for X Factory is, uh, is to connect maker with uh, industry here in China. So uh, in the future, there will be uh, plenty of uh, amazing products and projects that. Uh, Create here in X Factory. We have prototyping labs, we have coding spaces, we have uh, courses and lectures that teach you about manufacturers. So, uh, if you guys are interested, please stay tuned to our WeChat accounts and to our Facebook page, and, and we definitely will got more and more exciting things coming up. And yes, and speaking of you know, community industries and market, and it's a great honor to have Sandy here today and to share with uh, us about the, uh, how to use crowdfunding to uh, go global and to be successful, uh, to have a successful uh, crowdfunding campaign. And um, without further ado, let's give a round of applause and, and to Sandy and, and welcome to Shenzhen. Hi everyone, my name is Sandy. I'm the Director of Strategic Programs at Indiegogo. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you all for coming through the rain to attend this workshop. I'm going to try to make this workshop worth your time today. Um, but before I get started, um, this organization, Chaihua and X Factory, is actually a brand new space that opened up. I attended Maker Fair in Shenzhen last year, which actually is hosted by their organization. So they're really great at creating a community um, and then a lot of new exciting projects through that event last year. Um, and so if you want to get involved in their community, definitely do so. They're really great. So today's marketing presentation is actually, I'll be using English, but I'll have slides in Chinese up there for your reference. Um, and then later on, if you have more questions, you can communicate with me in either language and that will be okay. So to start with, before we even talk about crowdfunding marketing, let's just get in a good place about our mutual understanding of what crowdfunding is. And to me, crowdfunding is a really great way in the hardware space for companies to launch new products, validate new markets, and really start to test that market to see whether or not you have a product that's a good fit for a specific customer set. So what is Indiegogo specifically? So Indiegogo, you can start with a product idea, you can start with a product that's already made, you put it on our crowdfunding platform in order to tap into our audience of millions of users, and then once you're done with that crowdfunding campaign, that's not the end of the story. You can continue to sell through our in-demand e-commerce platform. So what Indiegogo really is in the business of doing is helping to build and foster businesses. It's not just crowdfunding, it's not just a one-off project. We want to make sure that you're building a business for the long run. What does that platform look like for us? Um, over a billion dollars in funds raised for over 700,000 entrepreneurs to date and accessed in over 230 countries, which is a really great, great way for you to figure out if your markets are in China or in the United States or in Europe or anywhere else around the world. Oh, and uh, one quick note, a lot of people, I get this question a lot, what does it cost to crowdfund? So this is simply um, an illustration of our platform fees, which is um, similar to e-commerce, so the Indiegogo platform takes 5% of all the funds you raise. Um, one thing to always keep in mind is that credit card processing is another set of fees, so that's just something to be, be mindful of, so that's 3% and 30 cents per, per card transaction. So all in, from a platform fee perspective, we're looking at 8% of the total funds you raise, but that's not including anything you'll invest into marketing, which um, we're going to have a little bit more of a conversation around how much money to budget for marketing later on. So one story that I want to share about how hardware crowdfunding is used um, is this story that's very near and dear to my heart. This company is called Accentware. And Accentware is a pair of cat ear headphones that, that light up at the top. Um, so they're LED lit and they come in different colors and then the cat ears themselves are actually speakers. So it's a really, really fun 
um, audio experience and it looks really great. So the reason this story is so compelling to me is that I was actually a fan of the founder of Accentware for over 10 years. And she was actually, she started out as a web comic artist. She was always online just drawing with, uh, you know, a lot of different stories and characters. And this character here wearing the cat ear headphones, this illustration is actually from many, many years ago. What she learned through her artwork were that a lot of customers, a lot of her fans asked her, where do I buy these? Um, and when she looked online, you know, there were no cat ear headphones that with LED lights and built-in speakers. These didn't exist. So she actually turned to crowdfunding, she turned to Indiegogo, raised $3 million, and was actually able to bring this product to life. So when you walk into any Brookstone in the United States right now, the cat ear headphones are actually at the front of every Brookstone store, which is, for me, incredibly um, amazing as a fan of Lynch Moon, but probably for her, it was amazing that, you know, her characters who once wore these headphones 10 years ago, are now, she now sees real people wearing them, so this is a story that's really inspiring with crowdfunding. So what does this mean for companies that are potentially based across the globe? And since we're in Shenzhen today, what does that mean for companies here? So here are examples of companies that um, I've worked with in the past few months to help them launch their products. And effectively, what happens on our platform is that you put your product idea up, you put forth your best foot in marketing, showcasing to them as simply and as best you can what your product is and what it does. And if the market is interested, then they'll, they'll continue to support your product. So some fun projects for you to take a look at here. Um, U-Arm is a robotic arm that can help you with laser engraving. Um, and then GPD Pocket is a miniature netbook laptop product. Who Drone is a mini follow-along drone with selfie and um, self-video functions. And then Mate is a foldable electric bike. So it, it looks like actually there are a lot of different types of products. And I want to share a little bit about my own experience with crowdfunding. So before I joined Indiegogo, I actually worked for a company that was based in Beijing. We created a piano product with light-up keys. So you see the, um, on top of the piano keys there are actually lights that show you which notes to play. And our goal here was to help people um, with any piano skill learn to play a song uh, irregardless of how much money they had for private lessons or how long they've spent learning music. Um, so we actually ended up raising about $460,000. That was exciting, but actually what was even more exciting um, was the fact that we were able to use crowdfunding as a market entry tool. So just through crowdfunding alone, we got coverage on all of these top tier media outlets in the United States. And what that did for us was anytime anyone looked up what piano they should buy in the United States, they were able to find our brand in the top search results. So for a brand new brand that has no sales history and no customers, this was really, really helpful for us so that we could, we could find new customers and put ourselves, because we, we knew we had a good product, at the same footing as a, as a Casio or a Yamaha, which are companies that have been around for centuries. And then, in addition to that, we used our early crowdfunding sales to talk to our retailers. So we had a conversation early on with Guitar Center and Best Buy and Walmart. And typically for these companies, if you haven't gone through the process, they actually ask you for things like your company's uh, credit score, so to speak, a D&B number, and they ask you for all these things that a mature business would have, particularly around you know, who are your customers and what do your sales look like. And for us, we said, we know exactly who our customers are because we saw that through crowdfunding. And then we were also able to say, we've already sold a thousand units, so you're not really taking a gamble with us. We're just opening up a new sales channel. So we were able to open all of these channels within six months of our crowdfunding campaign ending. And for me, that was, that was probably the fastest way to get the product to market than I had experienced from those around me. And again, here are additional case studies around companies that have launched. So um, OmniCharge here is a portable charging product that has enough juice to charge your laptop. And they were able to sell over uh, $2.4 million. Here's Mocha Cam. It's a wearable uh, camera that you can use to record the happenings of your everyday life. And so now the question is, we've seen a lot of really successful campaigns. So how do we get there? Um, and to make sure that everyone's listening today, actually, I want to show you, I'm wearing this t-shirt. 
Uh, it says sort of create, innovate, and time use is a limited edition Indiegogo shirt. I've got four of them here. I'm going to have a short little pop quiz later on asking about the materials I've covered. So if you if you want to put your thinking caps on and start um, paying attention here, this will, this will be good because you might get one of these shirts. So what does it take to run a crowdfunding campaign? Um, a lot of people, when I, when I first approach them, they think crowdfunding campaign is putting together a page and then setting it live and then expecting that you know, if the product is there, the customers will come. And that is, um, that is a false, false theory and strategy. The most successful crowdfunding campaigns, 100% of the time, come with a very strong soft launch. And what a soft launch is, is that you are telling and priming your customers and market for your launch before you actually even start launching the thing on Indiegogo. So what that typically takes the form of is preparing your materials, making sure you have the right shots around your product, um, making sure you have a video to explain what your product does, and then lastly, collecting a customer waitlist. And this customer waitlist is really important. We're going to cover that in this presentation. So let's talk about the first one. So how do you start preparing your materials and setting a goal for crowdfunding? The first thing to take note of here is that setting your goal um, and setting your timeline is actually dependent on what your internal goals around crowdfunding are. Are you using crowdfunding more as a market validation tool? Are you using it to secure a certain amount of funds and sales to meet a minimum order quantity? You need to know what your goal is and you need to set a number. So for example, if you want to hit a million dollars in sales versus 200,000 in sales, that will dictate a very different pre-launch timeline because if you want to raise a million dollars, you might spend a lot more time collecting a customer waitlist. And the second thing is that crowdfunding is not just about having a ready product. Actually, taking things like a campaign video or taking really great product shots takes some time and it takes brainstorming and you actually might not get it right the first time, especially around the campaign video. Because what happens is the campaign video takes quite a while to create, so you might have started that a month in advance. Then, through your early pre-launch testing, you realize, hey, my customers actually don't see my product in this way that I created my video with. So in that case, you have to go back and edit it. So effectively, you really do have to start thinking about this as a holistic marketing launch versus just, hey, I'm going to go make sure that my manufacturing is lined up and I have my logistics partners. It's more than shipping a product. Here's an example of what I mean by preparing really great assets. So this product here um, is Actin. Um, Actin is an electric skateboard product. And on the left side here, we have really clear product shots, right? You have this, this topic here that shows you exactly what the product looks like in full view. And then you have a product that shows you the top versus the bottom. So a customer can see it, and they don't really even have to read all the text you have. They just have a very strong understanding for what they're buying. And then on the right side here, we have these really great lifestyle shots that illustrate what the product does. So rather than one, one example would be like to illustrate a 30, that it could like go a 30% incline rate, I could potentially take a picture of the motor or the wheel and try to explain it that way, but that's not compelling enough. Instead, I have this image of this guy riding up a really steep hill in San Francisco, and that just shows to me, you know, a person who might already want and thinking about using this product for commuting on hills, it just shows to me very easily without having to read anything that this is a perfect product for that. And the second one here, you see um, this, this customer riding through a bunch of different cars in San Francisco. It's a, it's a you know jam traffic day, and this is why you don't choose to drive a car and you want to ride a skateboard, because it's nimble enough to get you through all the spaces there. In terms of timing, the other thing to consider is that every product is different and that there may potentially be some seasonality involved with your product. I'll give you one example. I worked with a team recently that launched a heated jacket product. So a heated jacket, a jacket that uh, can, can regulate your temperature and keep you warm. So do you think that that product would be a good idea to launch in the summer in the United States? Probably not. All of your customers are probably you know, sweating at their computers and then all of a sudden you're telling them, hey, this jacket can keep you warm. They're not going to put, they don't have budget set aside to buy products for the winter in the summer. So you really want to make sure you capture the right seasonality. Another example of this is, um, let's talk about an air purifier product. If you talk about different markets, in China, maybe an air purifier product makes a lot of sense because there are areas that are polluted and maybe the air quality is not so good. 
But if you talk about the United States, an air purifier that's used indoors might only make sense in the springtime when you have a lot of allergies. There are a lot of flowers or the, you know, there's some pollens and pollutants in the air, so you would, want, you would want to launch that product in the spring versus in summer or winter when you might not necessarily think in the United States that an air purifier is useful to you. So the second thing, the second piece of staging a very successful pre-launch is making sure that you have a really good landing page and that you're able to test your customer set with that landing page because your landing page is sort of the window into the first sneak peek and window into your product launch. Um, so one of the most important elements of a good successful pre-launch is not revealing everything. Um, I run into a lot of teams that are very product focused and what they do, the first thing that they do is they list out all of their product specifications and features because they assume that customers seeing this really long list will be really impressed by the product. But that's not what you want to test for. You don't want someone thinking about that much quite yet. What you want to convince them of is that you have a product for a very, very specific thing that they need to purchase. And you want to test which angle about that product is most interesting. So I'll give you one example here. Um, I work with the team River um, by EcoFlow Tech. They actually just finished their campaign at a million dollars. And they actually really struggled in the beginning. This is a portable power generator product. It's about, it's about this big. It's, um, it's a rather bulky portable power generator. And when they first launched, they couldn't figure out if people wanted to use this power generator indoors you know, in your home, or like plug your laptop into it, or use it more for outdoor settings, like flying a drone perhaps, you know, you have to change that drone battery quite a bit, or when you're going camping and you plug on all of your, um, your camping gear into it. And through, through their pre-launch, they actually, they sort of show the product and the use cases, showing you this, this power generator product in a camping environment versus being used at home, charging a laptop, and they were able to quickly test which customer set was most interested in them. So now if you find out that the camping outdoors audience is your biggest audience, then you can actually, during the live campaign itself, frame your entire page around that. Then all of the images you show are around camping and outdoors. Instead of wasting you know, half of your campaign showcasing a bunch of different images of like this in your couch or like in your living room or coffee table setup. So the conclusion here is, do not reveal all of your information quite yet. You want to give them something a little bit more to learn about so that they want to come back to your page. Um, think of it this way. If you've told them everything already and they weren't interested, you're not going to get them back. So you want to show them sort of like a teaser. Make it a teaser, and then when your campaign goes live, you send them an email letting them know, hey, you were interested in this, now I'm going to give you the rest of the information. So this is, a, this is the call to action aspect of a campaign landing page, which is really important because in order to build a strong customer waitlist, you need to collect that customer's information. In the United States and European markets, your best point of contact for this customer will be their email. Um, you can think about it like this. So in the US, I believe the average time browsing Facebook is around like 45, 60 minutes. So if you're not capturing that person's attention and they're, you know, they're seeing all their friends and the news feed and ads and everything else, if you're not capturing them during that time, it's going to be hard um, to get their attention. Whereas um, in the U.S., um, especially in the tech early adopter city, which is the primary crowdfunding market, I'm opening my email and I literally have to go through my entire email list um, in order to make sure that I'm sort of getting my work done and that's, that's my to-do list. So email is the best point of capture for customer information. So on your landing page, this is what you'll set up. You'll let them know exactly what's happening. And the message here for EcoFlow Tech was pre-orders are available in April. Uh, it's not available in two years, it's not available in 10 years, it's available in April, which is a few months um, from the time when they were announcing this. Um, the countdown here is really interesting because it, it, it invokes sort of like a time-sensitive element that gets people excited about doing it now rather than later. Sometimes you might be excited about something, but you're not sure if you want to take action on it now or later, and you know, time sensitivity is always an, uh, a great value add toward getting them to do something now. Um, you should also include what the incentive is. So, you know, the question that I ask when I sign up for any email list is, so what? You know, you have a newsletter, I subscribe to 200 newsletters, why do I need an extra one? I'll just come back to it if I'm interested. So you want to you entice them with 
things like discounts or getting limited access to um, limited quantities or different price points. And then the last one here is just making sure that it's really clear what you're asking for, which is um, a, you know, a text box here for your email address and then signing up. Um, and it's always great to have little disclaimers like we respect your privacy or we won't spam you just because email is such um, a valuable unit to us and we, we just receive so much of it every day. So the last thing here is as you're building up that customer waitlist, realize that there are different ways to store your customer's information with email being the highest converting channel. So typically what we see, these are average numbers again, they depend on uh, the quality of that customer information you're getting, but on average we see that an email marketing list will convert from five to 10%. Um, another example here is perhaps you don't actually have to get those emails yourself. Let's say we're talking about EcoFlow Tech and I learned that camping was by and far their largest um, application for the product. So that team would reach out to a website like campinggear.com or some sort of outdoor magazine and say, can you blast this product in your email newsletter for me? That way you don't have to collect their emails necessarily, but you're still getting access to that list. Website cookies, um, so if you're unfamiliar, anytime you visit a website, um, you, might, you might actually have that, your information of that visit stored on that site. And website cookies are great for uh, what we call remarketing or retargeting. Um, you, can install, you can install these uh, cookie trackers on your site by pasting a line of JavaScript, which is very easy to generate from like Facebook or Google or another remarketing site. And the last one is social media fans. And this is a controversial one um, that I, have, I, I think that we all need to learn a little bit more about. So um, one of the common missteps in strategy I see with crowdfunding is someone will say, I want to buy 100,000 likes before I launch. That means I have a big enough list size. But you have to realize the way that Facebook works is that you cannot reach everyone who has liked your page again. So once they've liked it once, but if this person hasn't engaged with the page content, um, such as commenting on posts, regularly checking up on the page, um, it's actually very hard to reach them again. You might have to use ads to, to refine those customers. So I would say that if you have any sort of mind share or budget to spend on advertising, likes are not a meaningful unit or measure of your customer's engagement. I would focus a lot more on email addresses. So um, again, I really do want to stress that email marketing is absolutely one of the most important things. Um, we talked about the five to 10% conversion rate. Uh, which I'll actually go into a little bit more detail about. But the other thing to realize is that an email address actually gives you um, a discovery point about that customer's information in other ways as well. On Facebook, there's a really neat advertising functionality called um, lookalike audiences. It's a custom audience. So what that means is, let's say I've collected a customer waitlist of about 1,000 emails. I upload that list of 1,000 emails into Facebook, and Facebook doesn't tell you exactly who they are quite yet, but what they will do is they will find similar people. So let's say, for example, that your audience is actually where ages, that email list was actually um, people from ages 25 to 35, and they were male, they live in Texas. You wouldn't know that necessarily just based on their email, but Facebook does. And what Facebook will do is it will expand and scale up that audience. So you can, it'll allow you to continue to target 1% of the population in the US with the same similarities and characteristics as that email list. So custom audiences are very powerful. And the last one here is remarketing. Um, remarketing is also a great way to reach customers who might have engaged with your page in the past, but not really done anything. So a one common example of remarketing you might have experienced yourself is sometimes you might be browsing uh, Amazon.com or Nordstrom.com and you added a product to your checkout page um, you went to check out and then you looked at it and you decided, I don't really want to buy this right now. So how do you how do you capture that really interesting customer? They might have not bought it because you know it wasn't on sale or just some small decision factor. So remarketing allows you to find that person who abandoned their cart, didn't purchase, and compel you get a second opportunity to sell through. So you can compel them with something like, hey, you know, time's running out, you won't get to buy this later, or there's some sort of discount here. So, and we'll talk a little bit more about remarketing as well. So how do you know how many emails to collect? You could literally spend forever collecting a customer waitlist, right? Um, this is a rather sim simple way to think about it. Um, and I think the number of emails you want to collect depends on your goal. So let's take that Acton electric skateboard example here. 
let's say their goal was $50,000. They want to sell $50,000 as their, as their crowdfunding goal. Um, each product is $500, so what that means is you have to sell 100 units of a skateboard to reach your goal. So how do you hit your goal really quickly and on your first day? The way you do that is by sending out that email, that promotional email, telling your customers that this product is ready to purchase. So based on, let's say on the lower end, a 5% conversion rate, um, I need about 2,000 emails, about 100 of the people in that 2,000 email list will purchase the product, and then I will get my goal. Of course, conversion rates, again, will vary depending on your list quality, how you how you've enticed them to sign up, but um, this is a really great framework to think about how you can start hitting your goals. Let's talk a little, a little bit about remarketing. Remarketing is so powerful and it can drive so many conversions for you, especially because crowdfunding is a 30-day event. So you have all of these time-sensitive and pricing, um, pricing things to work with to entice people to actually purchase the product if they didn't complete the checkout the first time. So I want to illustrate to you exactly what remarketing is because sometimes it's a little bit hard to grasp. So in the first example here, um, so I, you know, uh, I was looking up these KitchenAid products, um, you know, refrigerators and ovens, and I was on their site, and then I added something to check out, and I ended up not purchasing that day. It's a really expensive item, so it's not something that I would impulse purchase right away. And that happens with crowdfunding sometimes. You have products that are more than one hundred, two hundred dollars, and it's not a product that you can impulse purchase. So um, I decided not to buy it. A few days later, I was reading this article in the New York Times, and it, the, this is actually a remarketing ad. So they had collected my cookie, they collected sort of my information, where I went, and then they sent me this ad with the exact product I was looking at, just to remind me that I haven't completed the purchase yet and that I should complete that. So that's a really great example of um, the Google Advertising Display Network. So the Google Display Network can show up on all of these different sites, like news sites, um, or e-commerce sites, or anywhere uh, that's not Facebook. And let's, let's see what happens on Facebook, though, because I think this is also interesting. So um, I was also looking at a product um, on Nespresso. It's basically like a single brew coffee machine. Um, I, I've been wanting to buy one forever, but it never went on sale, but I did add it to cart, and then uh, a few days ago I was browsing Facebook, and I saw the ad with the exact same model and the exact same color I was looking at. And then I looked at it, and I was like, oh, you know, this is something I wanted to buy, and Facebook puts it front and center, and there are 16 likes, and, you know, my other friends, Kira and Anna, both like Nespresso as well, and I was like, oh, this is so cool, um, and, and then I click back in, and I end up buying it. So this is what you can do on Facebook um, with remarketing as well. So you can see with crowdfunding how powerful this notion can be if, let's say, Nespresso and this coffee machine were an Indiegogo or crowdfunding, and then a customer, for some reason, decides not to buy it, and then as they're browsing their feed, they see, oh, that's that cool product I saw the other day. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to buy it because that campaign ends in two or three days. So the next topic here is how we can use digital marketing in general to reach our goals with crowdfunding. I think the, the thing I want to preface before I even dive into that is that you need to understand what digital marketing is and the differences between all of your different channels. So um, oftentimes when I'm consulting companies on their launch, they tell me, uh, hey Sandy, can you introduce me to a PR agency? Or can you help me with PR? Or can you help me with marketing? And that's a really, really general term. So the first thing I want to point out here is, um, let's start with the middle one here, exactly what PR is. So PR actually stands for public relations. And what that means is like reaching out to media outlets and pitching media and journalists or bloggers or influencers about your product so that they can actually publish something about your product. And that's very different from running like a Facebook ad, if you can, um, if you can imagine that. And then the term that that differentiates from is paid marketing. So paid marketing is what we just talked about, going to Facebook or Instagram and Google, putting forth some budget so that you can target new users and cold traffic through advertising platforms. So inherently, that's a much different skill than someone who is um, you know, making relationships with journalists, sending samples, and helping you pitch your product to media. And of course, just redefining um, the, the really important email marketing strategy here. Email marketing is where you're collecting that customer waitlist in the form of actual emails um, and collecting
collecting is not just the end of the story, right? You're sending them actual content through the emails, letting them know when to reach you, showing them important information and useful information about your product. So how do you get started with all of this marketing stuff in the first place? There's, there's a million different angles to go about, especially if you, have, um, if you have a product that can be used by a lot of different people. And the way that I like to start brainstorming how to position your product and figuring out who your end users are is by starting with a really high level assumption about what your product is, who your customers are, and then trying to form your best hypotheses about who those customers could potentially be. So the example I want to use here is the company that um, I actually did crowdfunding for, which was the Smart Piano. So let's, let's start at the very, very high level, right? So how do I figure out how to position this piano or who my customers are? At the very, very, very high level, my piano may potentially be bought by people who are looking to buy pianos. And that could be parents, that could be kids, that could be adults, that could be women, that could be men. And then I want to really break out those segments into different use cases for a piano. And through my early interactions with customers at trade shows and my assumptions about the value of the product, I actually pinpointed this to about three different audiences. Um, these were beginner musicians trying to learn how to play piano on their own. These were children who, when they're trying to learn piano, um, may be off-put by traditional lessons, and so their parents are getting them a piano to learn on their own. And then there are adults. There are adults who are pursuing music because they didn't do so when they were younger, and really enjoy the idea of being able to learn piano on their own. So then, how do you actualize this into marketing data? So at the, at the high level, if someone's buying a piano, they're probably looking for a specific or different kind of piano. Um, and these probably have a lot of search terms. So when I go onto Google Keywords tool, I type in, um, you know, people looking to buy a piano or buy a piano or piano for sale, and then you see all of these related terms. Um, sometimes people don't know the differences between pianos, so they search very, very um, explicitly on Google, best digital piano, expecting the web or Google to give them an answer to that. And then 88 key digital piano, so they're looking for a piano that's bigger with 88 keys rather than 61 keys. And then black piano versus a white piano versus a mahogany piano. Um, and we have a black skew, so that could appeal to them. But what, what you actually end up wanting to do in order to position the product is figuring out what's the specific angle or channel that my product is most interesting to people. And this is where it gets interesting, where you have the, the niche long tail keywords that are related to your product. So instead of just best digital piano, it's best piano for beginners. Because the value proposition of my product is that you follow along the lights and you don't need to learn how to read music. So for someone learning to read music, they may still prefer a traditional $50,000 grand upright piano versus my product was $700 and it was really suitable for beginners and the price point works a lot better. Uh, pianos for kids, so rather than a piano that you know is really big and really long, maybe a kid wants a shorter piano with keys that are a little bit more flexible and without the hammer action. And then the last one here is piano with light up keys, um, which is exactly the value prop that we offered and it turned out there were actually people looking for that product already um, and yet there were no products available to fill that need. So how do you investigate these? Um, here I've listed two free tools that are really great to help you start honing in on that product positioning. Google Trends is a really great way um, at, a, at a high level snapshot to compare different trends of let's say like a white piano or a black piano or pianos versus guitars, figuring out exactly what angle is your best angle. And then Google Keywords helps you get in on the demand of the market for specific long tail terms. So that could be an 88 key piano, pianos for kids, pianos for adults, but you really, really want to go deep on that and figure out what's the smallest niche I can expand on so that when I'm creating my images, laying out my page, that I'm appealing to the right people. So let's talk a little bit about how you can reach out to media and journalists to get coverage for your product. I think this is always one that um, teams struggle with because they feel that they're ne not necessarily best friends with any reporters and it feels like a TechCrunch or a New York Times is out of reach, so it feels, it feels very challenging, right? Um, but you want to put yourself in the position of the reporter and think that if you're going to write about anything in the world, 
It should be something that my readers really like, that's really interesting and relevant, and probably something that's special information that only I have access to relative to anyone else. I don't want to report on things that they can read in other outlets. So um, two things to keep in mind when you're pitching. Um, the first one is uh, what an exclusive is. An exclusive means providing one journalist, one media outlet with a special thing about your story and not giving it to anyone else. So if you're going out there and saying, hey, we're launching this really cool product we've been working on in Stealth Mode for, for 10 years, um, but I just told the entire world about it, then why would this journalist want to publish it if everyone else is already publishing it already? Um, so that makes no sense. They want to provide new, important, exclusive information. And the second term to be aware of is what an embargo is. So let's say that you actually had a great conversation with TechCrunch or a media outlet, and they were interested in publishing. But how do you stage that so you're getting the full advantage of that media article? So you want to you wanna work with that reporter and say, hey, I'm launching my campaign in two weeks at 6 a.m. PST time. Can you make sure that this report goes out after? Because I know that you're linking back to my campaign, and I want all of that traffic going to my page. If you launch that article before you go live, all that traffic is wasted. Where is it going? It might be going to your landing page, and it's just not a good way to capture all of that, all of that interest and demand. You want them to link to something that they can actually purchase through. So staging embargoes is very important. One of the great resources that I think is uh, free and widely available to everyone is that in order to make sure your content is um, the content that you're pitching is relevant to that reporter, um, you can use Google News for that, honestly, or just figuring out how to find the news articles um, and the reporters that are relevant to, to your topic and your product. So um, if you are, you are working on an electric skateboard and you randomly reached out to anyone at TechCrunch or media at TechCrunch.com, it's going to be really hard to find someone interested in your product. But you can actually use Google News to find out what is the most recent news about competitor products or products in a similar industry or a similar vein, and then find the specific reporters that wrote about that and pitch them. Say, hey, I saw you wrote an article about this. I thought you might be interested in what I'm working on, which actually is better than that in certain ways. Would you be interested in talking more, receiving a sample, um, and so forth? Um, so when you're pitching on media, uh, media outlets, what do you need? Just make sure you're prepared. You don't want to preemptively pitch and say an offer to share more information. Like if the reporter says, um, I'm be interested in testing a sample and you don't have any working prototypes, you're going to be stuck in a really bad place. Then they're not going to be interested. You might have burned your reputation with them the first time. So you want to be as prepared as possible. Um, and that's, that's on two fronts. On the product front, I recommend having five to ten samples at least that you can, um, at the ready, that you can ship out to reporters and provide some sort of return uh, shipping label for them if you want it back, um, so that when they actually try the product, they feel they feel a lot more confident to write about it. And the second front is making sure you have a lot of assets to share. So you don't want just the write-up and a bunch of text. You want assets with a lot of interactive videos and, and images to showcase exactly what you're working on, because honestly, when people are reading long articles, they really do skim through the, the meat of the, the text and they really look at the pictures and whatever videos there are. So just now, earlier, I have presented a lot of work that you have to do on the marketing front. So how do you get all this done? Or if your team is a brand new startup, how do you make sure that you have all of your bases covered? With crowdfunding, marketing, and launches in general, it's not a bad idea to think about what sort of partners you can work with in order to make sure you have a successful launch. Realize what your own team's strengths are and where you potentially may have less experience. On the less experienced front, you might want to talk to other people who run campaigns, done marketing, but um, at some point you also have to realize that that might not be, there's a time trade-off there. If you are on the product front trying to figure out manufacturing and uh, you don't want to spend you know, two additional months learning how to run Facebook ads and designing images, right? You want to make sure that the best person suited to do each role is doing them. So here's an example of what might, you might consider to do in-house versus outsource. Um, on the marketing assets front, Sometimes you know you understand your product and you have a team that can help take pictures of the product. You might be able to create your own website, set up your own Facebook accounts, but then your team may not necessarily have an in-house uh, videographer who can create a compelling product video. In that case, you might want to consider having a third-party video agent create that for you. 
um, running ads is a very common one I see where uh, in-house skill sets um, are not necessarily um, there right off the bat. And then on the product side, you design the product, you do your own customer service and support, but sometimes you need a contract manufacturer to work with. Um, or on the logistics shipping front, you might need partners there as well. Um, and sort of summing this all together, we just need to make sure that we have the right resources to run a project. Never underprice yourself, because when you underprice yourself, you will not have enough resources to go forward. You want to make sure that you're pricing in a way that mirrors your product's position in the market, so your customers don't undervalue who you are and what it is you're building, but also making sure you have enough money to keep operations running. So uh, typically, this is the cost spreadsheet that I like to use sort of as a framework for crowdfunding pricing, which is what's the earliest, what's the lowest price I can charge for my early bird discounts and my perks? Typically, people will calculate the hardware costs, the logistics costs, all of the platform fees, and all the margins that you give out to your, your distributors and partners, but they, they typically skip this step here, which is calculating the cost of your marketing. So let's say that I actually didn't charge this $20 here, and I charge $100 um, for my product, and then I find that I only have $10 left per unit, and then I have all these unexpected costs. What you can actually do by building in marketing into your pricing margin is that for every sale that you make, then you have an additional amount of money to continue to reinvest back in advertising and marketing so that you can grow your campaign. Whereas if you don't have this, it's going to be really hard to justify from your end continuing to use Facebook ads or any sort of paid advertising channel to, to grow your campaign. So just make sure you create that buffer there. And for those who are interested in how, how I get this uh, 15 to 20%, so um, in my experience, uh, a one to five return on your ads is, is a good one that you should, you should strive for. Again, it'll depend on the product category. Um, but what this means is that for every $1 in advertising that you spend, you generate $5 in sales. Um, and in my experience, and if, if, I were, uh, if I could invest in a stock that yielded $5 for every dollar I put in, I would honestly pour my life savings into that. Um, it's, a, it's a really good return and you want to continue to grow your campaign if you get that. But if you do not make money because you didn't build this $20 margin in, it doesn't make sense to continue to put money into advertising. So that's, that's it from the marketing workshop portion. Um, I think we can do a short Q&A here. I uh, hope, hope that was helpful. Let me know if you have any other questions. Thank you. Any questions before I dive into my pop quiz? Hi, thank you. Uh, I have uh, one question. Is the best time to launch a crowdfunding campaign? And the best experience running Smart Piano, uh, when did the company launch it? At what stage? So we know, okay, this is the right time. We can do crowdfunding. Thank you. So from a timing perspective, I think there are um, the two questions you asked. On the first one, I think product readiness is always important. Making sure you have five to ten working samples that you can showcase and validate that your product's working. Because a lot of crowdfunding backers these days, they don't want to get burned. These are customers who are willing to wait five to six months to get their products, and they need to believe that your product exists. Um, part of that validation is being able to have a unit to ship to media and journalists and um, hosting events and showing it offline and proving that it's real. The second one is when, it, when is a good time to launch? Um, again, I do think that mirrors the seasonality of your product. So we talked about the heated jacket, right? You don't want to launch a jacket that keeps you warm in the summertime. That makes no sense. You want to launch that heated jacket in the winter when everyone's buying clothes that are warm. Um, the other consideration to have here is just holiday season in general. I think of crowdfunding as a as sort of like an e-commerce behavior as well. So if you don't want to launch during major holidays. Um, one example, during Christmas time in the United States, after uh, after December 20th, no one's online. People are all shopping offline. Most of the sales happen offline. So you want to make sure that um, you're considering not launching on holidays as well. Um, holidays are also a time for journalists to rest, so you're going to have a hard time reaching them. Uh, okay, uh, I have a question. You mentioned about uh, we we have email marketing, email, uh, but where do we get the email uh, accounts? 
uh, where can we get information as we all the company in China it's very difficult to get an uh, overseas email accounts so do you have any suggestions thank you Yes, so I think uh, typically I see the way that a lot of teams in um, other countries will get access to these customer emails is primarily through three different ways. Um, one is their own network. So when you're launching a new company or launching a, your own product, you have friends, investors, family networks, maker spaces, the places you work. And these are going to be the people who are going to be your best supporters to like get you over that, that, that initial um, launch struggle. The second one is um, through offline events. Um, this is this is a tricky one because sometimes you'll leave like an email collection like sheet or a box, but honestly if you've had a really long conversation with someone and they're able to leave their email address, it's a good way to add to your list, but not a scalable one, right? You maximum get a few hundred emails from a single event. The third one is the most scalable and probably the most effective channel, which is through digital, digital advertising, through Facebook, through Google, through um, through other advertising channels. The way that works is that you have your landing page that we took a look at, which showcases um, the teaser of your product. You leave an email collection box there, but you use Facebook to drive the traffic to that page. And the reason you don't want to collect emails on Facebook is because when I signed up for Facebook like 10, 20 years ago, I actually used an email address that I never check anymore. Right? So you want to make sure that you are showcasing an ad, ad, an ad that leads to your landing page that's about a little bit more because they have to read through that information to leave their uh, their contact information and then have them leave the email there. Um, so that would be your highest converting source. Hello, Cindy. Hello. And uh, I'd like to say that you're very pretty and smart. And uh, my question is that uh, I just... Uh, could I have an individual teacher? I, I really like that. Uh, yeah, so we're going to do a pop quiz. So if you get a, an answer here shortly, um, we can get you one. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Is there any strategy that for Indiegogo we have to have a uh, different form for the Kickstarter? Sorry. Is there any strategy for the Indiegogo? Uh, we have to have different form for Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. So are you asking like main differences in general or just like is there something different that you do for Indiegogo? Yeah, um, you know, I think I personally have not run a Kickstarter campaign so I can't speak too well to how to succeed there. But I do see with my clients that have launched on both platforms, one of the differences is that Indiegogo operates a lot more similarly to an e-commerce platform. So one example of that is that we actually have built-in um, product SKUs. So that means if you offer like five different colors for a product, you can actually configure them into Indiegogo. Um, whereas um, other platforms, you might have to figure out your process and your strategy around like surveying the backers after the campaign ends. Um, just so just just be aware that as you're doing like advertising or if you're trying to figure out like how on logistics and customer order front you want to get products to customers, that's going to be quite different. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for this really nice introduction to Indiegogo. Really, really well, well done. After all this happens, so after you have the successful crowdfunding, uh, Indiegogo continues to support you, right? You have this new, is it new egg or something like that? How, how does this work, work? I would be interested in like, because you, you want to build successful businesses, not just one time crowdfunding. How does this work? You, you like you take the eight percent or the five percent, which you you could which you took from the crowdfunding, and you take the same when you continue to host it on this new new egg platform, or and do you support the marketing then, or can then these products use your your channel, your reach you have with with all the information, with all the customer base you have, with like you're also building up a huge huge uh, database for, for marketing. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I'll speak to the first one you asked and uh, share a little bit more about our post-crowdfunding programs as well. Um, so the first one is uh, we do have relationships with offline and online retailers such as Amazon Launchpad, Target, Newegg, and we're working on a few with Best Buy and several other retailers like Brookstone. So what that means is when your crowdfunding campaign is ended um, and you're almost ready to ship the product, you reach out to me or someone on my team and we broker an introduction to these retailers for you. So um, you have the double validation sort of from our team saying that this is a really great product and the second one is you can bypass all of those crazy logistics around doing line reviews with all of the retailer buyers and just have a direct conversation with their team focused on innovative products. So this is a great way to help expedite you into the retail ecosphere. Um, the second one is our own on-platform e-commerce. So that's the in-demand program and our, mar our, our brand new marketplace, um, which is actually new. I don't know if much of you have heard of it. In-demand is actually a continuation of crowdfunding success. And I, think, I like to think it's best used between when a crowdfunding campaign ends and when you start selling in other retail channels. Because in between that time, you're kind of doing nothing or not nothing, so to speak, but on the sales front, you're not able to continue collecting momentum. So in demand's a way for you to continue your pre-orders before you have any formalized sales channels. Now we have a brand new um, offering called the, the called the Marketplace, which is also a 5% platform fee where you can sell products that are ready to ship. So these are products that we guarantee to all of our customers that will ship within two weeks. This is really exciting for crowdfunding backers because now they can buy all of these cool products that are ready to ship onto the market. And again, um, it's similar, similar platform fees, but something that you can use in addition to Amazon or in addition to Target because we know that we have an audience that really likes cool products like that. And then um, our, third, uh, our, our third service for startups after the crowdfunding campaign is that we actually just announced our global partnership with Aero Electronics. And Aero Electronics gets on phone calls with you to help you figure out your product certifications, your logistics, your product design, helping you find contract manufacturers, all for free, uh, unless you choose to work with them as, as sort of a manufacturing partner or purchasing supplies from them. But it's a great way to get experts who are, um, who are who have worked with thousands of other contract manufacturers, delivered millions of products, and can sort of be like your mentor or your advisor in the manufacturing process. Hello. Can you use English to ask me a question? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. 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 如果是在我们在中国做，如果在Indiegogo中投的话，那如果用美国用户，他怎么去处理这个物流的问题？对，我想知道是一个一个寄给他们，还是说Indiegogo可以在美国帮助我们解决在美国用户的这个发货的问题
嗯，这个预热的话，嗯，我的经验中，它可能要做一到两个月的时间，呃，众筹的话，三十到六十天，然后从众筹结束到发货那个时间的话，它嗯没有个平均数的，它可能差不多半年之之前之内的都都可以。呃，那印第六狗的自己的政策是最长可以接受多久？因为我们现在有个问题就是，我们的外壳模具，因为我们现在没有钱了，就是想一方面在找融资，一方面可能也会通过众筹的款来完成这个事情，所以的发货时间会长一点。它的政策最长会是多久？呃，其实我们平台并没有任何规则关于这方面的问题，我们只是看我们用户的反馈。就如果说你之前跟你们的用户在页面上说你们是一年后发货，然后他们还是选择买的话，那是他们自己的选择，然后他们也可以接受这个时间的。呃，我之前也帮过几个项目，他们是呃一年半后才发货，然后他呃因为这个团队经常跟用户嗯更新他们的这个信息，然后一直 update 他们的这个 timeline， 这个用户都觉得没有问题。哦，好的好的，谢谢谢谢。Uh, in this year, uh, uh, in Indiegogo and Kickstarter is a quite a international crowdfunding platform. And in this two years, is a uh, many countries such as China, Taiwan, and Japan making the more local domestic crowdfunding uh, platforms. How do you think? Uh, how to make the project in domestic or global? Uh, is your question does Indiegogo have customers in like other parts of Asia? The, 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 and also the. Uh, project uh, can be more international or uh, still be the uh, still be the domestic. How you think the choosing the platform and also the project uh, product relationships? Okay, so um, Indiegogo, most of our backers are based in Western markets. So our customers, the people who are backing these projects, are in like United States or Europe mostly. We still get a lot of interest from markets with a lot of um, technology early adopters. Like for us, like Japan, South Korea, um, Hong Kong, these are actually growing markets. But for companies that want to reach a more domestic market, we don't recommend using Indiegogo. Right, right. So if you want to reach uh, customers in China, do not use Indiegogo. It's not a good fit. You're not going to reach any customers in China. You should use like Dingdong or Taobao Zhongchou. And then for like Japan, like Kibidango or other platforms, and South Korea is, has some emerging platforms as well. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. My question is about uh, the issue about uh, the copyright of patent. I mean that uh, it's easy to. If your product is not that high tech, it's easy to copy your, your design or something else. Your idea, because so many people know your idea. If your product is just about the idea and how to uh, implement it, then it might be copied by others. So let's see. What's your, what's your worry about being copied? Uh, so is there any example or something related so we can share with us that uh, India Go can help us to uh, avoid this problem. You know, with copycats, I think that's something that no one can avoid. Someone just might be looking at your website or your page and they think they can do it better and they'll just copy it. But I think the thing we want to really build with crowdfunding is that if you have a community of supporters and marketing that's really great, and you run the biggest campaign ever, your marketing is really, really defensible and no one will care about your competitors. I'll give you one example. So the Acton skateboard here, if you go on Indiegogo right now, I can bet you'll find at least 10 electric skateboards. And yet Acton raised um, over $1.2 million on the platform. So when people look at crowdfunding, they're always like, how do I get a board like Acton board? And then when people are in San Francisco, they're just like, oh, is this as good as Acton board? So they really built a brand that's super defensible. And honestly, I'm um, seeing this product in person relative to um, all the other campaigns that are live right now in the electric board space. I've tried them all. They're all, the experience is actually about the same, really. Um, and I think they actually share the same manufacturers in some cases. But for me, what really stood out was how Acton convinced me that they have the best board. And it was through that marketing, showing me how I can climb the hills and showing me how I can like really navigate it in between cars. Um, so I think that rather than focusing on like how do I apply for every patent and copyright in the world, 
just focusing on how do I get my products into customers' hands, and then at that point, your customers, as long as you have them, they will just follow you everywhere and, and buy your products regardless of what you're called and, and you know what you're doing. Uh, can you share the project distribution from uh, different countries? Uh, projected distribution? Yes. What, uh, sorry, what are you trying to understand in that question? Uh, I mean that uh, how many projects are from the uh, USA and how many are from China? Like that. Yeah, so let, let's see. So that question is a little hard to answer because sometimes teams based in other countries will choose to um, create an office in the U.S. when they're taking on uh, the U.S. market, so they'll list as U.S. companies. So it's a little bit hard to pull out the numbers there. Um, but I can tell you, because I focus a lot on our on our China growth and program, that in the uh, China-based projects um, account for over 15% of the projects on the platform right now. Um, sometimes it's even hard hard to tell that because the marketing is so good these days. Yeah. Thank you. Want to add on next gentleman's question? Because uh, <laughs> and he asked uh, uh, the the time frame of uh, shipping. So, I, well, so I am going to add uh, speak in Chinese. So, I I I just want to ask. Uh, answer the gentleman in the first row. Asked the shipping time. How long? Because uh, because I am specialized in crowdfunding. Uh, so, uh, this uh, platform like Indiegogo, actually, we are the project creator, for example, if you a digital product, you have to decide when to ship it. In general, it depends on your production cycle. Some projects will ship for a year, some will ship for a year, but this is in your project's because rewards package A B C D and so on, right? So you have to write my reward. What is the delivery time? Then, according to research in 2012, a professional research, 73 projects are delivered delivery. So they don't have to delivered delivery. 所以，那我自己的研究那个更超过百分之七十，我我自己的研究那个是百分之八十五左右的 project 都是无法按时 deliver。所以你在你做了 cloud funding 的时候，你要及时的告诉你的 backer 说，嘿，我们可能会延迟 deliver。然后这个这个及时的 update 是非常重要的。所以我在就就最后总结一下，说这个 shipping 的时间是由你决定的，而不是 platform 去决决定的。Thank you。你好三弟你好三弟我想问两个问题第一个问题是比如说你这里说的是两千个有像两千个亿脉那这个两千个亿脉是否有质量的区别比如说有些人他的意向比较强有些人的意向没有那么强这是第一个问题第二个问题那么
，呃，就是更呃成年人的，就是更呃类似我们这么多平台的用户的话，他们呃会很用邮件的，所以你就你需要去测试他这个是否是对的人，对，嗯，第二个问题是，呃，我第二个问题是，如果没有达到我有需要两千个邮箱，我没有达到这个目标，那么我是不是不应该浪起这个啊产品？我是不是应该要继续的延长我的这个啊预热这样？对，是需要考虑延延延长这个呃这个 launch 的时间，因为如果你这个连邮箱地址都没有办法去争取到的话，那其实这个呃购买的转化会有很大的问题。所以，嗯，除非你把这个 marketing 方面的问题解决，你这个这个 live campaign 的问题会更大。所以我们这边会建议去去暂停，然后去重新考虑你的产品产品定位。你刚才有说到一个 forty percent 是什么？我没有听清楚。呃、uh, ，open rate 就是 open rate 是指呃、uh, open rate 是指有有几个用户会把这个邮箱打开，对百分之四十的人会把这个邮箱打开。就呃，就假如你收集了一百个邮箱，阅读了我的邮件。是的，是的。好，谢谢。Like our homepage or our email newsletters, it's it's two different ways. The first one is that、um, our GoGo factor, which is our algorithm. Our algorithm works very similarly to other e-commerce platforms.、Um, there's a quality score associated with each project, and that quality score is calculated on the basis of the activity and the engagement on your page, what percent of your goal is raised,、um, how regularly you're updating it.、Um, very similar to other projects, actually.、Um, and then. The second way that you can get featured is through our team. So our team has quite some editorial input into what gets featured. So if I'm working with a team that,、um, in in my experience, has gotten really great conversion rates on emails, and that I have belief is a good fit for our platform, we can actually、uh, put those projects on、uh, manually on our homepage as well. Uh, so、uh, Cindy has some T-shirts here to give away for、uh, those who ask questions. So we have、uh, how many do we have here?、Uh, so I'm gonna do a pop quiz. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah, I'm gonna do a pop quiz. So、um, do you wanna close the okay. PowerPoint? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I go to the, the、uh, final page. Okay. So I have four four shirts here. Again, it's the shirt I'm wearing. It says Chongzhou in in Chinese.、Um, limited edition shirt. Two smalls, two medium. They're they're actually quite large and quite they fit basically anyone.、Um, but I'm going to ask four different questions today. So the first one is,、um, what is the what is the average email conversion rate? Give me the two numbers, the the range. Five to ten. Five to ten percent. What do I pick? <laughs> okay, so whoever raised their hand first, I think it was you. Five percent. Five to ten. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who can tell me what? <laughs> you, you'll fit it. Don't worry, you'll fit it.、Um, who, can, who can tell me what、uh, what、um, what PR means and what what it stands for? PR, fellow in the yes. Public relations. And, so、what does it mean?、Uh, it means、uh, you engage with the media,、uh, magazines, outreach, that kind of Yay, thing. Yay, correct. Okay, I'm gonna、uh, make this a little harder. What was the name of the cat ear headphones? The name of the company that made the cat ear headphones. <laughs> I use cat ear headphones here too. Okay, I think that's it for us.
say thank you so much for coming. Um, I'll stick around a little bit if you want to chat. Um, thanks again for your time, and I'll pass it on to Violet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy. And this workshop is very informative, and also uh, uh, we really need it for a little bit. Yeah, sorry. So uh, and I think you have learned a lot about like how you prepare for the campaign and what you should do in the process of the campaign, and also the importance of updates and many other like, very important resources and information for you to launch a very successful campaign on Indiegogo. And um, we would like you to fill a little questionnaire uh, that we want you to let us know your feedback about this event and we, so that we can do better. So it will take you about maybe one or two minutes. Oh, sorry. Just go through this again. Okay. Here, so just uh, use your WeChat to, uh, to scan this QR code and then uh, fill in this questionnaire to let us know. And also, um, some of you might be here for the first time, and if you don't know much about Xfactory, we would like to give you a very short introduction. Xfactory is a makerspace that we are aiming at serving maker pros. So for makers who have certain skills and working on projects, welcome to come here as a member, and then you can use the space, use the equipment, and join activities like today, and also to share with each other, to build your projects. And also we have a strong connection with Indiegogo. So if your project reaches a certain stage and then want to launch a campaign on crowdfunding platform like Indiegogo, we can also connect you with them as well, and also we can connect you to industrial resources like uh, supply chain, manufacturing, and even like VC or incubators and etc. So uh, if you're interested, ask my colleague Lily there, the girl with glasses, <laughs> there's a hands there. So if you want to know about membership, ask Lily. And also if you want to ask more questions about Sandy, she stays here for a little while, so you can come here to talk to her in person. And how about we take a group photo together after this question?